Our presentation is with Dr. Chris Pockel. I'm Dr. Sheila Segerson, Director of Community Solutions at Maddie's Fund in Pleasanton, California. Dr. Pockel is a board certified veterinary behaviorist who is owner and lead clinician at the Animal Behavior Clinic in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Pockel lectures extensively worldwide, teaches courses at multiple veterinary schools in the United States, and has authored numerous articles and book chapters for veterinarians and pet owners. I could say lots of other things about him, but I do want you to be able to hear him speak. So I'll end now by saying he's an amazing clinician, speaker, and most importantly, an incredible human. And we're so lucky to have him here today. Welcome, Dr. Pockel, and thank you so much for being here. Good morning, Dr. Sagerson. Thank you so much for having me and to everybody at Camp Maddie for this opportunity. I, I'm truly looking forward to, to being a part of this today. Um, I'm really excited to be able to present on this particular topic today and to, to open up this conversation with you. Um, and I love the, the fact that we already have these caveats around the differences of opinion and the ability to, to have these conversations in a meaningful way. And, and that certainly is going to be true of this particular topic today. In order to kick this off, I want to start out with a, a, a bit of a conversation about, well, what is aggression? What are we talking about in, in this particular conversation? Now, we're going to be focusing on risk assessment, but I want to make sure that we're thinking about this from the standpoint that aggression can be a lot of different things. It can be the behavior of the animal. It could be an unmet need and perhaps a learned response to those unmet needs, and then that's how the animal is showing up in the world. It could include their behavior as well as their attitude or their motivation or the emotional state and even the readiness to, quote unquote, attack or confront. And we know that that can include a lot of different things, whether we're looking at body postures, facial expressions, the vocalizations of the animal, or perhaps snaps or bites or other contact points between the animal and whoever or whatever the target happens to be. And I think, you know, a, a place that I'd like to start this particular conversation is, is in the words that I heard uh, once when I was presenting on a, on a related topic. And we were talking about aggression specifically in dogs. And I remember somebody came up to me later and said, why would anybody keep an, quote unquote, an aggressive animal? You know, there's so many good dogs out there and they, those, they use those words specifically. There's so many good dogs out there. Why would someone keep an animal in their home that has the potential to cause harm? And for those of you who are in the industry or have perhaps ever had to face this, this conversation or this question in, in your own life, you know that there's not a simple answer. We know, especially from our observations in shelters and in homes, that essentially every animal has a threshold at which they may be triggered to aggress in some way, shape, or form. We know that in most circumstances, that aggression is a form of communication, and animals do have a voice, and they're going to express that in a variety of different ways. Lastly, as we start to think about risk assessment, this is not just a yes or no or a black and white decision. There's a lot of gray within this conversation, and we need to understand context and how these variables interact with one another. What I'm going to share with you today is heavily influenced by my, my both my personal and my professional experiences. To some degree, this is objective, and I'll show you certain measures that we can look at or things that I use within my practice when I'm doing a risk assessment, but there's also a fair amount of subjectivity here, especially when we get to the side of how do we communicate these details with pet owners or how do we make these, these decisions within a shelter uh, where we're trying to decide the, the fate of an animal that's, that's in our hands. There's a lot of different factors that we're gonna consider. And most importantly, at least for this particular conversation, focusing on the risk assessment. Um, and as I do that, if there are other other variables that you think, oh gosh, this should also be included in the conversation. You're probably right. I can't possibly get through all of these things within a 45 minute discussion, but I'm going to do my best to get through as many as we possibly can and, and do them justice along the way. When I'm thinking about a risk assessment for dogs who have shown aggressive behavior, I am most commonly looking at these four factors. And this is both sort of proactively as well as reactively or retrospectively, I should say, when I'm when I'm thinking about the cases that have come through my office or those that I've consulted on within the, the shelters uh, in my area or across the country. You're going to see this slide multiple times, so I'm not going to go into the individual details here. But if you're ever looking for that sort of one slide, sort of a, 
What's my checklist? What are the things that I'm considering? This is at least a good place to start. And of course, as we're thinking about a risk assessment, we know that this goes hand in hand with our consideration of treatment and what would it look like to actually improve the behavior of the animal. I always think about that from a three-pronged approach that we're, we're absolutely trying to include behavior modification and training as a way to change the emotional state or the behavioral repertoire of the animal in front of us. And how do we manage the environment of that animal until such time that their behavior has been successfully modified, knowing that management could be really intensive in some cases and relatively minimal in others. And of course, in the three-pronged approach, we're also thinking about medication and where and how that might play a role if and when it's indicated or needed. When I think about the risk assessment, though, I'm really thinking about this, this middle one, the environmental management, the safety piece, and that brings me back around to those factors of the risk assessment. We're going to start out by looking at a couple of the pet factors, those that we can typically get essentially in a glance to be able to say, who is this animal and what might those considerations be based on what I see in front of me? The first one that I've listed here is the age of the animal. And I put just a couple of details here on the slide. Again, this is not comprehensive, but it's something to, to get us thinking about some of the variables, knowing that if we see aggression in a youngster, whether it's pediatric or juvenile or whatever label we put on that, at that stage of development, we're typically thinking about Again, probable motivations of fear, although certainly other motivations can be evident as well. And depending on how flexible that learner or what their trauma history might include, uh, the, the response to treatment is going to be pretty variable. That might be a different consideration if we're looking at an animal that's perhaps more at the geriatric stage of their excuse me, of their life, where we may be dealing with medical concerns or sources of pain or discomfort that may actually be progressive for that animal, meaning we may not have as much success truly resolving or eliminating those factors. And it may be something that is going to be, again, as we talked about, progressive and actually getting worse despite our best efforts. And certainly we can look at other developmental stages, those that overlap with sexual maturity or social maturity, and see how those things may impact our risk assessment. So this is sort of that snap judgment of which factors may be relevant here when it comes to age. I also think about the size of the animal. And this is uh, really kind of, on one hand, thinking about our ability to manage. A small animal is generally more easy to manage. They can be scooped up, they can be held, they can be restrained more easily. And again, I'm not saying that physical control is the only recourse or the only course of action here, only to say that especially in the early days of any intervention, management and control and safety is often a big part of our decision. To what degree can we maintain that control until such time that we've been able to modify the behavior of the animal? I also think about size in terms of the dependent, uh, the size dependent potential for injury. Now again, Chihuahua versus Great Dane, that's one way to think about it in terms of the absolute size of the dog in front of you. But we also have to consider that in relation to the target of that animal's aggressive behavior. Even if we're talking about that same Chihuahua, if the target of aggression is another Chihuahua, we've got a one-to-one -one from a size ratio standpoint, or if the aggression is directed toward a small child or an infant, for example, even that small Chihuahua is significantly large enough to inflict an injury that could be problematic. So this is absolute, but also relative in terms of the environment that that animal is housed within. I also think here when we're thinking about the the, the animal nature or the, the pet factors, I think about breed. Now, this is far from straightforward as those of you in the industry absolutely know. We know that it is difficult to identify breeds or animals of particular breeds just based on their phenotype or their physical appearance. And even if we could reliably identify that individual just based on their appearance alone, that doesn't give us the ability to accurately predict what that animal will or won't do. And so I, I really try to be cautious here. Now, keeping in mind that there are certain things that, for example, if I was looking at a border collie, for example, versus a basset hound, there are certain behavior patterns that may be more likely to show up in one of those breeds than another. 
but I can never predict the behavior of an individual dog based on breed alone. Where breed also shows up for me is really in terms of some of the, the, the safety factors. So especially when we're dealing with aggression, for example, and we think about tools like muzzles, ideally basket muzzles, something that allows the animal to prant, pant and breathe and perhaps take food if we're using that as part of our training or behavior modification plan. And yet the physical confirmation of some dogs makes that challenging. I didn't say impossible, but it makes it more challenging. And so what are the options that we have for the dog in front of us based on their breed, based on their age, based on their confirmation in terms of the available safety tools that we have? These are all things that we need to be able to consider as we're thinking about some of these pet factors. Now, the thing that I really think about in those particular factors is that I can't change those. That four-year-old English bulldog, for example, is who they are. I can't change that, but I can accommodate for that in various degrees, and I can include that as part of my risk assessment when I'm thinking about whether or not this may be an animal that's safe or reasonably safe to place within the, within the public. And we'll talk about uh, acceptable level of safety here in just a, a little bit. The next group of factors though that I wanna look at is, is the bite history. And here thinking about factors like the severity or the patterns or perhaps the presence or absence of warning signals from that animal. And we know that the severity of aggression can vary widely from one situation or from one animal or one instance to the next. We could see the low level severity incidents that may include head threats or hard eye or vocalizations without actual attempts to bite or injure. And then we could move all the way up to you know, head threats, uh, superficial contact, minor injuries, moderate injuries, all the way up to the point of significant injury, potentially to the, to the degree of, of death. We do have some objective data to be able to look at some of these scales. I put two of the examples on this slide here. Uh, I assume that these are probably familiar to most, if not all of you. So I put them on here just as a way of saying, yes, we have ways of measuring the incident. What I really try to be very careful of, though, when I'm looking at either of these scales or any of the other ones that are available for dog-to-dog -dog injuries, for example, is that these describe the extent or the severity of the injury. This does not reliably assess the motivation of the animal or the arousal state or any of the other factors. So I don't necessarily treat this particular risk assessment detail in isolation. I have to think about this in terms of, let's say a level three bite in a particular context in the context of an individual who was behaving in a particular way or responded in a specific manner. So again, one of the contexts, one of the variables, but not in and of itself, uh, at least in the way that I utilize this information. I will say on the next slide, I do show a facial injury to a child. If that is a sensitive topic for you, feel free to look away from your screen for just 30 seconds or so. I'll give you an additional indication when I've moved on to the next slide. Uh, moving to the next slide in one, two, three. When we think about the pattern of bites, this does matter. And I think about kids, especially in these contexts, as you see within the slide, for those of you who are looking at it, if I have a child who is leaning into hug and they're leading with their face, and if that is a provocative trigger for an animal, a facial bite may be more likely to occur. And that is absolutely of great concern. And I want to be clear that that's different from an animal, perhaps, if we're thinking about a bite to an adult, someone who is leaning in to engage with that animal, and the animal bypasses the hand or the leg or other closer proximity body parts and targets the abdomen or the face. I don't necessarily consider these things equal to one another when I'm considering it. So I say that in both directions. I want to know the context. I want to know the variables of that incident before I necessarily make an immediate judgment about whether that's of, uh, of greater or lesser concern. Okay, I've moved on to the next slide for those of you who chose not to look at that one.
I also think about these details in terms of an aggression ladder. And, and what I'm talking about here is, is not the idea that every single animal will always escalate in a ritualized manner from green all the way up to yellow and orange and red in the way you see described on the right-hand side of this slide. But a lot of them do. And while the individual rungs of that ladder may be different from one animal to the next, I'm often utilizing this to establish um, more of a perception of predictability. Do I have a dog within their pattern of escalation? Do I have a dog who escalates and de-escalates in a ritualized manner based on increased or decreased provocation? Or do I have an animal who's more of a rung jumper, if you will, that in perhaps in situations where arousal is a factor, we have an animal who is aggressing in a way that, that may be more dangerous compared to other animals. Uh, and also thinking about this from the standpoint of, of a bite inhibition, as we were talking about with those bite uh, severities on the previous slides, and also understanding that if all we have to go on is a singular incident, I personally find those to be some of the more challenging ones to identify and to interpret and to really assess. Yes, I can work through the details of that incident and I can create some hypotheses about what I think the triggers or the antecedents may have been for that particular incident. But until or unless I'm starting to see a pattern, I have to be careful about no, not over or under interpreting a one-off event. So one of the patterns that we're looking at here within the bite history truly, as I just alluded to in the previous slide, is arousal. And arousal is essentially a word to describe that level of activation of the animal. Arousal isn't inherently a negative or a positive thing. A certain amount of arousal is, is normal and very appropriate. And yet, if we have an animal who is easily stimulated to heightened levels of arousal or struggles to regulate that emotional arousal in benign or provocative situations, that may encourage that animal to react in an excessive way compared to the behavior of other animals. And this may reflect some of their underlying medical history, especially if there's any degree of pain or discomfort, perhaps their learning history, if they've learned through prior experience that escalating quickly and with great intensity is a better way of handling that situation. And certainly we can see other factors relative to what's going on in their internal physiology. So all of those factors for me kind of get clustered under the bite history, basically starting out with who that animal is, who or what that animal is, thinking about the description of the incidents, and then thirdly, looking at the context or the antecedents under which those behaviors have occurred, and to what degree can we predict future behavior based on the patterns in front of us. So the first part of this is really the, the who, what, why, where, and when. And we know that animals can be very, very context specific in their behavior patterns, including aggression. This photo is a reminder for me of a conversation I had with a colleague years ago who had assessed one of these Great Danes and had determined that this dog was aggressive in certain circumstances. And the owner supplied this photo in response to them saying, no, 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 you've got it wrong. My dogs are not aggressive, look, they can have these raw meaty bones and I can walk right up and take those bones away and they don't aggress at all. So this label of aggression is wrong and I need you to, to, to take that back essentially. And what that individual was failing to recognize is while their dogs did not perhaps show resource guarding or whatever label we choose to put on that aggressive display to maintain priority access or achieve priority access to a valued limited resource, they absolutely were aggressive and dangerous toward visitors to the property or the home. So that context specificity is something that we need to consider when we're assessing individual incidents. Now we're doing this in most cases based on the historical information available, the recount or ideally the video that we have of those individual incidents rather than through provocative testing. And I say that because, as I said before in one of the previous slides, essentially every animal has a bite threshold. Me being able to provoke a reaction today on Wednesday morning at 9.25 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time in Portland, in my house, 
does not necessarily give me the ability to predict what that same dog would do tomorrow in a different environment under a different set of circumstances. So we have to understand that to the best of our ability while also recognizing if you've got an animal that's in front of you in the shelter and all you've got is a bite report with minimal detail, now we're flying blind. So this goes in both directions, get the data, but we don't always have what we need to be able to truly understand what's going on. Now, I'm, I was mentioning here while we were talking about this particular slide, the maybe the value or the problem with labels. And I hear this a lot when I'm talking with, with clients who are sort of pet owners who are surrendering, or perhaps those who are seeking assessment for a particular incident. And I see all kinds of words that are used that give me perhaps maybe a level of emotionality or an interpretation, but not a lot of actual data. And this always reminds me of this uh, campaign that Dr. Susan Friedman has had ongoing for, gosh, more years than I, than I can probably even recall. But the idea that when we're thinking about understanding antecedents and behavior and consequences, utilizing labels eh, kind of can be helpful in some circumstances. Maybe it gets us into the right ballpark, but it certainly doesn't give us the full picture of what's going on. And they're certainly not objective enough for us to be able to assess whether a dog or any other animal for that matter is responding to whatever interventions we're putting in place as we try to make that situation perhaps safer or less risky. So as I move beyond there, while we're still in this particular aspect of our assessment, the context is really important. And, you know, especially when I'm talking with pet owners who may not have the level of education around these issues that many of you on this particular session have, I'm reminded that so many of my clients and pet owners and surrenderers would say prior to the incident that their animal, who might look a bit like this one on this slide, was, well, fine. I don't know why it happened. It came out of the blue. It came out of nowhere. She's always been fine in those situations. I'm sure none of you have ever heard that particular word in those descriptions, right? And yet when we have that recent race and bite and we go back to videos or pictures of that animal, we often see things that look like this where we may have an animal that maybe have been described as shy or timid or not really all that social. And so I really try to remember as I'm interpreting some of these antecedents and context that a lack of aggression doesn't necessarily equal fine. And when I'm trying to get information from surrenderers or pet owners about incidents that they've observed, I can ask my questions a little bit differently to try to get to some of those detail points that may actually then influence the way that I approach that particular assessment. And ultimately what I'm trying to get to within this area of my risk assessment is can I understand the relationship between the behavior of the animal and those antecedent conditions well enough that I can predict with a reliable certainty what that animal is likely to do in future situations. Now that's different from saying, sort of in the rear view mirror, I can understand or explain the behavior of that animal. I'm trying to establish predictability. And that usually requires that there have been multiple incidents that have occurred in similar enough context that we have a sense of what that animal is likely to do, not guaranteed to do. But if I can get a reliable level of predictability, that generally allows me to define the circumstances or the environment or ways in which I may be able to manage that dog so that we can maintain safety as we go forward. Now, that's ultimately what we're trying to look for is even whether, whether we're thinking about uh, uh, someone who's considering surrender or if we're considering placement, is there an environment under which this animal with its current patterns and current behaviors, would it be able to be safe? And we'll come back to, as I mentioned before, to that acceptable level of risk uh, in just a few short slides here. The last of the four factors that I consider, back to the same slide that you've seen multiple times already, is the level of exposure to whoever or whatever might be a target of that animal's aggressive behavior. 
And here there are a number of factors that come into play. And again, I don't have time to go into all of them, but just a couple of examples to raise our level of awareness here. The first might be the presence of kids. Now, whether that's kids who live in the home, kids who live next door, kids who visit frequently, we know that when there are kids involved, there are certain things that are sort of inherently more challenging to navigate. Kids themselves can be a little bit unpredictable or a lot unpredictable in some circumstances. And especially when we're not just talking about those kids, but also their friends and their friends' parents and all of those additional ripples that we need to consider where kids are involved. And that for me is relevant regardless of whether the children are actually in danger themselves or whether they complicate our management practices by opening up doors or leaving gates open or helping by letting the dog out and, you know, little things like that that can interfere with best laid plans from a management standpoint. I also think about some of the factors where adults may come into play when we're thinking about the exposure level or the potential targets of aggression, especially if I have any additional concerns such as someone who is perhaps immunocompromised or may have cognition or memory deficits that may interfere with our management attempts, or perhaps even an inherent inconsistency or maybe a family member who is not on board for our management plan and someone who is actually working against the rest of the plan that we have created. I also think not only about the targets themselves, but what we might describe as chaos theory or the influence of chaos on our management plan. And we all know, or I presume we've had exposure to households that are more structured versus those that are more sort of fly by the seat of your pants or more casual or maybe even more chaotic. And seeing the impact that can have on management and safety in a way that actually has almost nothing to do with the dog itself or its level of bite inhibition or its level of predictability and everything to do in which in the environment in which that animal finds themselves. So whether it's the owner's management style or perhaps the presence of multiple dogs that creates more chaos as we were talking about with kids on the previous slide, or even multiple people that all have to be in similar alignment in order to be able to implement that plan. These things all make our management plan more challenging and perhaps increase the level of risk in that particular environment. I'm also thinking under this exposure category about the ability of my clients. Now I have to be very, very careful when I'm talking about this because I will tell you that I have made some snap judgments about my clients over the years, whether it's something relative to their mobility or their starting point in terms of their understanding or their motivation to move forward with behavior modification. And I am wrong just as often as I'm right in terms of what that owner is actually going to do or perhaps what they're going to be capable of doing. So I try not to look at this as a way of saying, here's what I think is going to happen, but perhaps things that I need to be able to accommodate for. So for example, in the photo here, if I'm working with an owner or a caregiver who is themselves, uh, in this example, on crutches, while that doesn't tell me that they can't manage the dog, they probably have to manage that dog differently than someone else. So if I'm stepping in to assess or provide recommendations, I have to account for the attributes, the abilities, or the lack of abilities that are expressed or displayed by that particular owner. And I can ask those questions to figure out what is within their capacity, and we can create a plan as best we can, while obviously maintaining respect and, and compassionate communication and empathy for their situation, whatever it happens to be. And we can identify those potential obstacles to that safety and implementation. So I look at all of these factors, which, you know, I'll, I'll be very honest. So it's taken me about 30 minutes to run through all of these details so far, moving relatively quickly. And yet when we're looking at a particular dog in front of us, a lot of these things we're able to assess relatively quickly, especially some of those pet factors or understanding a bite incident itself. And um, we can get some more information as we said about context and exposure. We're, we're starting to kind of create a picture in our head of what might constitute an acceptable level of risk. Now, this is the place where, in my opinion, things start to get a bit subjective. 
where it's a little bit difficult to say with absolute clarity exactly what the risk happens to be. And as you all know, when we're talking about behavioral outcomes or the way in which we approach different intervention plans, uh, it depends, right? It depends on a lot of different factors as to what is in this case going to constitute an acceptable level of risk. I'm gonna describe for you three different scenarios taking into account those four factors that I just outlined for you. So let's, and I'll move through these examples relatively quickly so we can do more of a comparison rather than de debating the merits of each individual detail. So dog number one is, let's say it's a Mastiff, 140 pounds, uh, somewhere around 65 kilograms. They've inflicted a level two bite, so contact with superficial injury. With a brief history, we're able to identify predictability through consistent antecedents for behavior for this particular dog. And based on that understanding, we think we can manage that dog's exposure to their particular targets or triggers. How does that dog compare to a Labrador sized dog, maybe in the 35 to 40 kilogram size? A level four bite in this case, so we've got a, a puncture that's deeper than the, the deeper in depth than the, oh my gosh, I always get tongue, tongue tied on this one. It's deeper than half the length of the canine tooth of that particular animal in which we can often see incisor bruising or incisor punctures as well. So level four bite, also though with consistent antecedents leading to manageable exposure. How is that the same or different from that terrier sized seven or eight kilogram dog with a level three bite, still a puncture, but with less depth compared to that level four. But in this case, we've got variable antecedents and an inherent degree of, well, unpredictability, which is going to make our management plan significantly more challenging to say with certainty that we've managed safely. So I look at these three animals and say, who's the riskiest one? Who's the safest one? And we could all argue that from, from differing angles. And ultimately, when I'm working with an owned animal, it's generally up to the owner or the caregiver to, to determine what can they take on in their particular environment. What is their capacity to provide safe and appropriate care? Now, that's get a little bit different when we're talking about an animal within the shelter population where we're trying to decide whether this animal has the ability to be placed in a somewhat unknown environment, right? At the time that we're often doing these assessments for a dog who's within our care, we actually don't know where that animal is potentially going to land. We may be trying to direct that animal's outcome, but we're often trying to do a risk assessment while we're missing significant pieces of the puzzle that I just outlined. So this is a challenging game. It's a challenging process to be able to identify. And I will say that as I'm talking about this in, in, in terms of the owner or the caregiver typically in, uh, in, in charge of making that decision about what constitutes for them an acceptable level of risk, there are a couple of potential exceptions here when vulnerable populations are involved. So going back to those categories, perhaps where kids are involved or elders are involved in a way that they may not be able to advocate for their own needs or their own safety, or if members of the public are at risk, we as professionals, either as owners of the animal themselves or as counselors helping pet owners to decide what happens next, we may find ourselves in a situation where we actually do make recommendations, perhaps even involving some community organizations that are there to advocate for the needs of some of these populations. Now, going back to the decision-making process of actually saying, okay, if we are going to make these determinations, how do we actually start to do that? And something that I use when I'm talking this through with my clients is that I'm typically going through a decision tree. Now, I'm gonna go through this decision tree relatively quickly, and then I'm gonna circle back around and dissect a little bit more some of the communication elements of this decision tree in terms of how I use it within the practice in, in, in my, my population. So one of the first questions that we're often trying to ask and answer based on whatever information we have available to us is, can that particular animal, can they remain safely in their current environment? If the answer there is yes, 
Amazing. Then let's move forward with our management, safety plan, behavior modification, plus or minus medications. Let's go. But if they're not safe, if keeping that animal in their home constitutes a safety risk that is more than what that caregiver is able to take on, then it brings up a secondary question. Is there a different environment in which the animal could be safely managed? I'll come back to this one in just a couple of slides here as well. So for those of you who are raising your hand essentially to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're not just passing along that animal. Just, I know, I know, just hold on for just a second. We'll get there, I promise. So is there a different environment in which that animal can be safely managed? If the answer is yes, then that opens the door to considerations for rehoming or alternate placement and things along that nature. With that being said, if we answer that the animal is not safe in their current environment and we don't have somewhere else for that animal to be, then the remaining option from a safety standpoint is humane euthanasia. Now, keep that particular decision tree in mind while we go into these next couple of slides. I'm thinking about this from the standpoint of guiding a client, someone who is in the decision-making capacity through those particular decision trees, or if I'm working within a shelter, how are we as a, a committee or as the individuals who ultimately need to make these decisions, how are we considering our options? Now, if I'm counseling the pet owner through this, those black and white yes or no decisions and questions they, they don't take into account all of the other variables. I know that. And so before I go into that decision tree with a client or a pet owner, I'm usually phrasing it something along these lines. I have a couple of very specific questions that I want to move through relatively quickly. For the purpose of this decision tree, I'd like to, just for a moment, set aside your relationship with the animal or the emotional factors that go into this relationship. Those are so incredibly important and we will consider those too, I promise. But for just the next minute or two, let's set those aside to look at this from more of a procedural flow standpoint. And for most of my clients, even those who are really invested in that particular animal's outcome, it allows us to have a more objective conversation around those particular questions. I also tend to wait to start down that decision tree pathway until I actually already know the answers to the questions. I'm typically weaving those into my history or my intake so I know the answers before I attempt to move through that decision tree relatively quickly. And I have to be ready, especially if I'm talking with someone who's considering surrendering that animal, that when we get to that question of, is there somewhere else for that animal to be? I have to be ready to very briefly discuss what constitutes safe rehoming or not. Otherwise people tend to kind of get stuck there. And so, yes, there's a lot of things that factor into that particular decision, especially if we're looking at something that, let's say it's a dog who is aggressive towards kids uh, under very specific circumstances and has never aggressed under any other circumstances, moving that animal to a home without children and without child exposure might actually be completely and totally safe for that animal. Yes, I know it's difficult to say with any certainty that animal will never come into contact with kids, but that's the sort of, of, of decision that we're trying to look at here. Can we quickly discuss what that would actually look like? Now, what I'm aware of is that when I'm talking with clients about those decisions, it's not at all uncommon for that pet owner to say, I understand that this is unsafe. No, I don't have somewhere else for this animal to be and I can recognize that humane euthanasia is the safe option, but I'm not going to do that. And so now what? Where, where, where's our magic door number four? What I find in those particular circumstances, if I have a client who's not willing or able to consider that humane euthanasia as a viable outcome, keeping in mind, I'm not telling that they should or that they have to. In most circumstances, that's not my decision. But if I have a client who is unwilling or unable to consider that, and they've also recognized we don't have alternate placement options available and it's unsafe, then the piece that I have to come back to is where did we draw that line for what constitutes an acceptable level of risk or safety for that particular animal? 
And that gives me the opportunity with that particular owner to say, are you willing and able to accept that as we go forward, the likelihood of additional incidents or injuries is greater than what you initially said was okay. And there's a liability involved with that. And we'll come back to liability in just a couple of slides. But it gives me the ability to set expectations for that client in relation to that three question decision tree. Now, what a lot of my clients often say in a moment like that is, I mean, I, I hear you, I hear you, I, I, I get it. I know in my head that these are the options that do or do not exist to me, but how could I possibly make a decision about what to do next when he or she is absolutely amazing 95% of the time or 99 point, you know, 99.7% of the time, whatever that number actually is, it's not a hundred percent. The follow-up question that I have for clients in this particular scenario is to what degree, looking at that third factor of the risk assessment, to what degree do we understand the relationship between the behavior of the animal and their triggers or antecedents? If I can identify when and where and how that 5% risk is going to show up, cool. I can probably help create a management plan that's going to successfully mitigate that risk. If it's possible, let's do it. But if, if we're trying to decide based on 5%, especially if it was one of those dogs like the little terrier, where I don't fully understand the relationship between triggers and behavior, it's not 5%. It's actually 100% of the time there's a level of risk. And so I lean then in those moments on what I consider to be more the medical model of making recommendations. It's not my job to tell the client what to do. I can present options and give them potential outcomes and allow them to make the decision about what they do next. And I do that with the awareness that, well, not all help is helpful the way I've got listed on the top of this slide. I say that I've got the responsibility to provide information and perspective and the owner has the ultimate decision. And yet that was really hard for me to come to terms with earlier in my career. And at least for me, I'm not saying that my story is the same as everybody else who's, who's listening to this particular presentation today, but at least for me, I'm a helper. And so stepping in to try to help that client and help guide their decisions is very reinforcing for me. And so in my early days, I thought that the best help I could give them was a recommendation. And as I've thought about this more over the course of time and talking with veterinary social workers and so many brilliant members of our community, in most cases, I find the clients don't actually need me to tell them what to do. They actually need to be heard and they need clarity to be able to make the decision for themselves. And that reminds me that in that situation where a client may be asking us something along the lines of this question. If this was your dog, what would you do? If this is someone surrendering to our shelter or our organization, they're asking us the question, what would you do? And in my earlier days, I found myself sort of leaning in to say, well, I'd probably do this, 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 and this, you know, or maybe I had a similar situation and this is what I did. And yet again, in, in conversation with folks who are brilliant in these particular areas, what I now say is something along the lines of, I appreciate you asked the question. I appreciate that you're asking me my opinion in this scenario. And the honest answer is that I don't know. I don't know what I would do in your situation because I don't have your budget or your house or your family. I don't have your relationship with your animal. I don't have any of those variables. So me putting myself or trying to put myself in your situation is probably an unfair comparison. But given what you've told me already, I am concerned about certain aspects of safety. Can we circle back around to that? I suspect that your decision is going to be based on those factors. So on one hand, it's entirely appropriate for people to ask this question, but how we answer it really needs to factor in all of these other emotional components as well. 
keeping in mind that however we answer has liability involved with it. Whether we're thinking about that as the caregiver, the professional, or perhaps the organization who's making these decisions. Do we have appropriate insurance, documentation, waivers, client acknowledgement? These are all things that we may need to be able to factor into our process in order to mitigate these issues while recognizing that if we are in a situation or a, a, a powerful position within the relationship, either as someone who is responsible for whether or not we do or do not take an animal into our organization, or if we're guiding a client through this process, we have the potential for them to um, weigh our input in a way that changes the dynamics of that decision-making. All of this to say in a very, very short time frame, it's complicated. There's a lot that goes into this risk assessment, not only considering where it fits within our overall options, but also what are the factors that we need to consider in order to be able to help guide those, uh, those clients and to guide our internal processes within the organization that we represent. We've got a couple of minutes left, at least as I understand our schedule for today, we've got a couple of additional minutes here for questions. So I'm gonna leave my contact information up here for just a quick second. If you need to reach out for me for any particular reason, or if you're looking for additional webinars or podcasts, head over to drpockle.com. Feel free to check out some additional offerings there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pockle. We really, really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. But just a couple more minutes. Um, love seeing all the hearts and claps and celebration going up on the screen. Um, but let's jump into questions. Our first one is for bite history, how much weight is placed on the owner surrender stories versus what is observed in the shelter? Uh, that's such a great question, and it's it's such a common scenario. And I think for me that that it takes into a couple of factors. One, I think there are times where an owner is dis, uh, that is sharing a story that I'm listening for things that give me a sense of how accurately I think that owner or surrenderer is able to actually give me the data. If they're using very objective criteria versus subjective criteria, I may put varying levels of weight on that. But I also have to rec recognize that how the animal behaves in the shelter because of that environment may be more stressful or less stressful. It may be exposing the animal in a different way to their particular triggers. So it's not necessarily me saying one is more or less important. It's really how do I hold space for both of those things? And what do we think that means for what happens next for that particular animal? Thank you. Our next question is about warning signals, but also the environment and antecedents. And they ask shelter and behavior professionals may be more cognizant of warning signals and may notice subtle freezes, hard stares, etc. But the average dog guardian may not. How or where would this fit into risk assessment? I love that. And so that's something for me that especially with the story that's coming along with the animal, if I get some of those uh, descriptions of unpredictable or it came out of the blue, we never saw this coming, I'm going to file that away. But as I'm working with that animal, either in that initial assessment or as we're getting to know that animal, if I'm seeing consistent warning signs like the ones that the individual who wrote this question described, that tells me that this is an animal who is, at least under these conditions, communicating their intention and their emotional state. And it raises the likelihood that that particular owner just didn't see it coming. Versus if I have that particular story and in my observations of a particular animal, I find them to be relatively stoic or unexpressive, where I don't get a lot of signals, then that, in my opinion, creates a greater risk. It's going to be harder for anyone else stepping into that situation to successfully manage that dog without some of the more overt or obvious signals. But yes, there's often a big difference between what pet owners know to look for and describe compared to what we see. Wonderful, thank you. So next question is about labels and the 
question says, I really appreciate the discussion around labels. It seems like when one person, staff, volunteer, former owner labels the dog, it sometimes takes off and has a snowball effect and the dog becomes known for that one label. How do I prevent this? How do I help undo the labels? Such a great question. I think that's such a, an important piece. And we see that in the veterinary community as well as in the shelter population where that cat's chart gets labeled as fractious, for example, or we see that aggressive dog being labeled. Uh, and, and I think for me, what I'm really trying to do whenever I see a label like that is I try to ask some additional questions. So yes, maybe this was a dog that inflicted a bite or multiple bites. So I want to know what was the event, what was the, or the severity, what was the extent, what were the circumstances so that I can say this is a dog who is likely to elicit a level two bite under these particular conditions. The reason that's important for me is that if I'm moving forward with a behavior modification plan, either in the shelter or in the home, I need to have that objective data to be able to compare back to as my baseline. Otherwise, if I just say, well, this is a dog who is quote unquote aggressive and we do a whole lot of intensive BMOD and they're still aggressive, it may look like we haven't actually made any difference when in fact we may have a dog who has improved dramatically. Maybe they're not perfect because aggression may still be a part of their behavioral repertoire, but I have to be able to look at what are the actual measures of progress. So when I see a label, can we actually identify what that means in terms of concrete data that we can use for comparison? That's usually where I start. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Pockle. That's all we have time for, for live questions. But Dr. Pockle will be on Maddie's pet forum to answer any that we didn't get to and any new questions.